Welcome to the Pennsylvania Case Law Update While You Drive podcast. You give us less than 15 minutes per week, we will make sure you never miss changes in the law. This week's episode is brought to you by the McShane Firm. For nearly 20 years, the attorneys of the McShane Firm have been trusted by our neighbors and our friends to represent them in DUI and criminal law cases. Welcome back to the Pennsylvania Case Law Update While You Drive podcast. I'm your host, Katie McShane, and this is episode three. Today, we're covering cases filed between July 1st, 2020 and July 7th, 2020. There's a lot of information, so we're going to jump right in. The first area of law we're going to discuss is criminal law. In the case of Commonwealth v. DeJesus, the appellant was convicted of second-degree murder for a crime he committed in 1994 when he was 17 years old. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, which was the mandatory minimum sentence at the time. Subsequently, in 2012, the United States Supreme Court decided the case of Miller v. Alabama, which held that a mandatory minimum sentence of life in prison without parole was unconstitutional as it was cruel and unusual punishment, and in 2016 decided Montgomery v. Louisiana, which made the decision in Miller retroactive, meaning it would apply to all cases, even those that were decided prior to 2012. In 2017, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decided the Batts case, which held that there is a presumption against a life without parole sentence for a juvenile offender, but that can be overcome if the Commonwealth proves beyond a reasonable doubt that the juvenile is incapable of rehabilitation. Appellant's original sentence for life without parole was overturned, and following an extensive resentencing hearing, he was resentenced again to life without parole. The court found that the appellant had shown no rehabilitation during his time in incarceration and continued to engage in aggressive and criminal behavior. He has been diagnosed with personality disorder as well as other mental health conditions for which he refuses to comply with treatment. This appeal follows his resentencing. The Superior Court found no error with the trial court's resentencing, saying that the Commonwealth met their burden at the resentencing hearing by proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the appellant was incapable of rehabilitation and affirmed the sentence of life without parole. The lesson from this case is that while a mandatory sentence of life without parole for a juvenile offender is unconstitutional, there are situations in which it is appropriate and therefore it is not always an illegal sentence. In a dissenting opinion, Judge Olson found that the evidence presented by the Commonwealth was insufficient to prove that the appellant was incapable of rehabilitation. The Commonwealth had established that the appellant had not yet been rehabilitated, but they had not shown that he was incapable of rehabilitation. In the case of Commonwealth v. Burton, Appellant Burton was convicted of drug delivery resulting in death after selling fentanyl to the victim, who died after using the fentanyl. The appellant was also charged with recklessly endangering another person, and on that count, the jury found him not guilty. This appeal followed. The main issue raised by the appellant is that there was insufficient evidence to sustain a conviction for drug delivery resulting in death when he was found not guilty of recklessly endangering another person when both offenses have an element of recklessness. It is well settled in Pennsylvania that inconsistent verdicts are permissible. Inconsistent verdicts will not be reversed as long as there is evidence to support the conviction. In this case, there was evidence sufficient to support a conviction of drug delivery resulting in death. The underlying or lesser offense of recklessly endangering another person is not required as an element to be proven in order to prove drug delivery resulting in death, and therefore the conviction remains. The second issue addressed by the court involved denial of suppression motion regarding cell phone records. Part of the evidence presented at trial was cell site location information. This is information that is obtained by looking at which tower a cell phone is pinging at a given time to determine the location of that phone. Approximately three weeks prior to trial, the United States Supreme Court decided the Carpenter case, which requires a search warrant to obtain cell site location information. The Commonwealth then obtained a search warrant for the cell site location information. The court found that there was no misconduct on the part of law enforcement and that the detective who sought the search warrant was a true independent source and that the search warrant was properly obtained. The lesson from this case is that inconsistent verdicts are okay as long as the underlying lesser charge is not a required element to prove the more serious charge for which the defendant was convicted. Commonwealth v. Steele is another criminal case asking the court to address sufficiency of evidence to support a conviction. Appellant Steele was convicted of aggravated assault, recklessly endangering another person, possession of an instrument of crime, and criminal use of a communication facility following a drug deal gone wrong. The brief facts are as follows. Steele was the driver of his truck, and he had a friend of his in the passenger seat. The two were driving and met up with a Nissan Sentra. Steele got out of his truck and approached the Sentra. He returned to the truck, claiming that he had been robbed while selling drugs to the people in the Sentra. A chase ensued, and during that chase, Steele fired several gunshots at the Sentra. Eventually, the Sentra crashed into a parked car, and Steele and his passenger fled the scene. Steele then turned on his cell phone to a police scanner in an attempt to evade the police. Approximately 45 minutes later, Steele was stopped by police and arrested. 
The court found that there was sufficient evidence to sustain the convictions for aggravated assault, recklessly endangering another person in possession of an instrument of crime, but there was insufficient evidence to support the conviction for criminal use of a communication facility. In this case, the communication facility is a cell phone. To be convicted of this offense, the Commonwealth must prove that Steele used a cell phone to commit, cause, or facilitate the commission or attempted commission of a felony. The court found that simply using the cell phone to attempt to evade the police after the fact was insufficient because it failed to identify that the use of the cell phone as a police scanner was done to cause or facilitate the commission of a felony. The takeaway from this case? Simply using a cell phone during or after a crime is committed without evidence as to how that use caused or facilitated the commission of a felony is not sufficient to satisfy the elements of criminal use of a communication facility. In the case of Commonwealth v. Lester, the defendant was convicted of involuntary deviant sexual intercourse with a child. The conviction was based in part on in-person testimony of the victim as well as a video recording of a forensic interview of the child, which was admitted under the Tender Years Hearsay Act. The Tender Years Hearsay Act allows out-of-court statements to be admitted at trial if the witness was 12 or younger at the time they made the statement, the content and circumstances establish that the statement is reliable, and one of the specific enumerated offenses is charged in the case at hand. The Act also requires sufficient notice in advance of the hearing to provide the other side with fair opportunity to prepare for the trial, knowing that the statement is coming in. In this case, the Commonwealth provided oral notice to Lester about one week prior to trial, and only provided formal written notice on the day of trial. The court found that this was insufficient notice to Lester to provide a fair opportunity to prepare to defend against the statement at trial. The judgment of the trial court was overturned and the case remanded, meaning sent back to the trial court for a new trial. The important lesson in this case is that proper notice does not simply mean notice. The notice must be far enough in advance to allow ample time and opportunity to prepare an adequate defense. The final criminal case for the week is the Commonwealth v. Clementi. The case of Commonwealth v. Clementi addresses the timeliness of a motion to reconsider following a summary appeal. In this particular case, the facts are of no consequence as the error addressed by the court is purely procedural. The Clementis were convicted at a summary trial, appealed, and subsequently had a de novo trial, meaning a brand new summary trial, where they were again convicted. The Clementis filed the motion to reconsider, which was dismissed by the court on the basis that they lacked jurisdiction to rule on the motion treating the motion as a post-sentence motion, which are not permitted in summary cases. The court failed to acknowledge that comment to the rule that does allow for a motion to reconsider. The Clementis then filed another motion to reconsider, nunc pro tunc, which means requesting that the court hear the motion even though the deadline for filing has passed. The second motion to reconsider was also denied, stating they lacked jurisdiction because they were time-barred from ruling on the motion. The appeal of the second denial resulted in the instant case. Here, the Commonwealth Court found that the trial court should have heard the motion to reconsider nunc pro tunc because the Clementis established extraordinary cause justifying court intervention, namely that the trial court failed to acknowledge that a motion to reconsider is not the same as a post-sentence motion and a motion to reconsider is perm permissible. Additionally, it was the trial court's error in scheduling the hearing outside the 30-day time frame to rule on the motion, therefore extraordinary circumstances existed. The Commonwealth Court ordered that the trial court does have jurisdiction and must consider and rule on the motion for reconsideration nunc pro tunc. The fine print in this case, the comments to the rule are equally important as the rule itself, and failure to comply with even the small details can result in a new hearing. The next area of law we'll discuss today is family law. Lancaster City Children and Youth Services, or CYS, versus the Department of Human Services, or DHS, is a case about what is required to sustain an indicated report of child abuse. In a brief summary of the facts, mother was at a park with her 11-month-old child when she overdosed on heroin. At the time, father told the officer that mother was alone with the child. Later, father told CYS that mother was never alone with the child. The CYS investigator did not find father's interview statement credible and as a result reported an indicated report of child abuse against mother. Mother appealed and after hearing it was determined that CYS did not provide sufficient evidence that mother was alone with the child because the case was based on uncorroborated hearsay testimony. Hearsay is a statement that is made out of court being offered in a hearing for the truth of whatever the statement asserts, and it is generally not admissible in court unless some exception applies. Uncorroborated means that there was no other evidence to support the truth of the statement. In this case, the hearsay statement was when the father told the officer at the scene that the mother was alone with the child at the time of the overdose. CYS appealed this decision, which brings us to this instant case. The issues on appeal is whether CYS presented sufficient evidence to support an indicated report of child abuse. In order to determine if CYS submitted substantial evidence, the court must evaluate the hearsay statement made by the father at the scene. First, it is established that the statement is hearsay as it is a statement made out of the courtroom and is being used for the truth of the statement, to prove that the mother was alone with the child at the time of the overdose. Next, the court must consider if an exception to the hearsay rule applies. In this case, the court found that the exception of excited utterance applied. 
An excited utterance is a statement that is made spontaneously when under the stress of a situation about which the statement is made. If a hearsay statement is an excited utterance, it can be considered in the hearing. The court found that because the statement was admissible, it constituted substantial evidence as required for an indicated report of child abuse. What's the takeaway in this case? Statements made to police in the heat of the moment are almost always going to have more weight than a crafted statement made at a later time. That is why excited utterances are admissible in court. The very nature of the statements makes them trustworthy. The next area of law is license suspension with the case of Hinder Litter versus Bureau of Driver Licensing. This case involves two issues. First, whether or not failure to provide a sufficient sample of breath constitutes a refusal. And second, whether the breath test procedures were unreliable because PennDOT failed to establish that proper procedures were followed. The first issue involves Hinder Linter's inability to provide a complete breath sample. The law is well established that absent evidence of a proven medical reason that no sample could be provided, failure to provide two consecutive breath samples is deemed a refusal, even if a good faith effort is put forth to provide the samples. Here, Hinder Linter provided no medical reason that he could not provide a sample, and therefore it was proper to deem his insufficient sample as a refusal. As to the second issue, because the testimony of the officer regarding Hinder Linter's inability to provide a sample was sufficient to deem the test a refusal without any reliance on the breathalyzer machine itself, there is no need to show compliance with the procedural requirements of the observation period or the operability of the machine itself. The last procedural argument that Hinderlinter raises is that he was not advised of the chemical test warnings. The court found that because he did consent to a test that was later only deemed a refusal, the argument is moot. However, the court did find that the officer was credible in testifying that he did read the chemical test warnings to Hinderlinter. What can we take from this case? Primarily that PennDOT need not establish that any procedural requirements were met when the case is deemed a refusal. This is unlike many of the other cases where procedure plays an important role in deciding the case. Here, it meant nothing at all. We'll be right back after a brief note from our sponsors. This segment of Pennsylvania Case Law While You Drive podcast is sponsored by The McShane Firm. The McShane Firm is Pennsylvania's largest and best DUI and criminal law firm. Their mission is simple. Make sure the presumed to be innocent remain innocent. The next area of law is municipal law. The Reading Blue Mountain and Northern Railroad, which I'll refer to as Reading, versus the Seda Cog Railroad Authority, which I'll refer to as the Authority, is a case about the Municipal Authorities Act and the Authority's bidding process to obtain a new contract for operation of rail freight on the Authority's rail lines. The facts can be summarized as followed. Reading put in a bid with the Authority for a contract, but after the first phase of the bidding process, Reading had the lowest score and they were eliminated from consideration. Reading then filed suit complaining of a number of violations of the Municipal Authorities Act and that the bidding process was unfair. After a detailed evaluation of the act and the bidding process, the court found that the authority did not violate the act and no evidence was presented to support Reading's argument that the bidding process was unfair. The case is lengthy and quite detailed, and as always, a link to the full text is in the case notes for your reading pleasure. The next area of law today is torts. In the case of Bowman v. Speer, the court addresses whether or not a property owner is liable in a car accident when a stop sign is missing from a four-way intersection on that property. The court found that the property owner was not liable under the restatement of torts because one missing stop sign is not enough to create a hazard all by itself. Additionally, there was no evidence that the property owner failed to act with due care, and there was no evidence of a breach of any duties owed to the public. The main takeaway from this case is that cases addressing liability are heavily fact-specific. You must find a duty of care and a breach of that duty, which was not present in this case. The court in Bowman addressed some other issues regarding recusal and legal malpractice, which were found to be without merit, so not worth diving into in this episode, but the full case is linked in the case notes if you're interested. Two cases on the unemployment segment this week. In the case of Spivey versus the Unemployment Compensation Board of Review, Spivey sought unemployment benefits after he lost his job due to spending time in an inpatient rehabilitation facility. Spivey, who was on probation, had a drug test and tested positive for alcohol and marijuana. He was detained for the parole violation and later entered inpatient treatment. Though he attempted to remain in contact with his employer, he ultimately did not have a job upon returning from rehab. The court found that his decision to enter rehab and leave his work was voluntary and with no action by his employer. The next prong to be evaluated is whether the voluntary departure from his employer was through no fault of his own. The court concluded that an employee is responsible for the consequences of alcohol and drug use and therefore his departure from work was through his own fault. As such, he was not eligible for unemployment compensation. 
In the second unemployment case of the week, the court evaluates what amounts to willful misconduct. Claimant Rusecki was an employee at a child care facility. She was terminated after leaving a sleeping child in a stroller unattended for approximately 20 minutes. She had taken the child out for a walk and upon return removed the kids from the stroller, inadvertently leaving a child behind. The child was not one specifically assigned to her supervision, but nonetheless, she was the last one to check the strollers. During the hearing, she claimed that she did check the stroller and did not see the child and it was not willful misconduct. It was simply a mistake. The employer argued that Rusecki should not be eligible for benefits because her failure to adequately check the stroller amounted to willful misconduct. An employee is ineligible for unemployment benefits when discharge from employment is due to willful misconduct. The court found in this case that the evidence presented failed to establish that Rusecki acted with deliberate and intentional disregard for the employer's policies or rules, and therefore Rusecki is eligible for unemployment compensation benefits. The next case involves wills and estates. In raid the merger of Universal Volunteer Fire Department into Point Breeze Volunteer Fire Association and the appeal of Penn 7 Volunteer Fire Department and North Bessemer Fire Department. Universal Volunteer Fire Department was a charitable organization originally incorporated in 1930. Point Breeze Volunteer Fire Association was incorporated in 1927, serving a similar function in the same general area. In 2015, Patricia Berg died. Her grandfather had been one of the original founders of the Universal Volunteer Fire Department. As part of her last will and testament, she left 10% of her estate to the Universal Volunteer Fire Department. In 2016, Universal and Point Breeze signed an agreement and merger, whereby Universal and Point Breeze would become one to maximize resources and improve community services. Meanwhile, the municipality passed a resolution creating two new volunteer fire departments, North Bessemer and Penn 7, and decertifying Universal. Resolution Universal returned all its municipal equipment to the municipality, but otherwise remained in existence. In February 2017, Universal and Point Breeze filed a petition in the Orphans Court to approve the merger. The municipality and the new departments filed objections. The crux of the objections was who was going to get the money from the Berg bequest, which was an amount over $300,000. The new fire department argued that they were entitled to the money under the doctrine of CPRE. The doctrine of CPRE essentially says that a donation or bequest to a charitable organization has to be reallocated if the original bequest would be unlawful, impractical, or wasteful. The new departments argued that because Universal had been decertified, it could no longer fulfill its charitable purpose of fire safety and that the money should go to the new departments because they were fulfilling the charitable purpose. The court held that the money should still go to Universal because of the Berg family connection indicated an intent the money should be for Universal and not just community fire protection. Additionally, Universal was still able to provide charitable services to the community. Therefore, the doctrine of sea prey was not applicable. The final case for the week has to do with workers' compensation. The case of Pennsylvania State Corrections Officers Association versus the Department of Corrections revolves around a corrections officer who was injured on his way to work and whether or not he was entitled to be benefits under the Heart and Lung Act, or the HLA. The Department of Corrections and the Officers Association are parties to a collective bargaining agreement, which is a written legal contract between an employer and a union representing the employees. In this case, a clause of the collective bargaining agreement states that issues relative to an officer's eligibility for benefits under the HLA are subject to binding arbitration. Binding arbitration is a form of settlement where the parties to the contract agree to have a third party, called an arbitrator, review the case and the parties have to accept the decision of the reviewer. In this case, the claimant, a corrections officer, suffered an injury while walking up the steps of the prison to report to work. He was not yet on the clock. The claimant then sought benefits under the HLA. The department denied his claim and the claimant appealed. As required by the collective bargaining agreement, the parties participated in arbitration and the arbitrator decided that the claimant was not eligible for benefits because the injury did not occur in the performance of his duties as a corrections officer. When reviewing an appeal of binding arbitration, the court uses the essence test. The essence test has two prongs. One, that the issue is within the terms of the collective bargaining agreement, and two, that the arbitrator's award can be rationally derived from the collective bargaining agreement. Prong two is what is at issue in this case, and essentially says that an arbitrator's decision cannot be overturned unless he has no basis or does not flow logically from the collective bargaining agreement. The Commonwealth Court reviewed the relevant case law in light of the collective bargaining agreement and found that the arbitrator's decision met both prongs of the essence test and the court affirmed, meaning approved the decision of the arbitrator, and held that the claimant is not eligible for benefits. Two takeaways from this case. It is extremely difficult to overturn a decision made by binding arbitration, and an injury occurring in the scope of employment does not include an injury that occurs on the way to work, even if you are very close and in uniform. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. I hope you've enjoyed the podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss a beat. Thank you for listening to Pennsylvania Case Law Update While You Drive podcast to make sure that you are always in the know when it comes to important changes in Pennsylvania case law. We want to thank this week's sponsor, The McShane Firm. The McShane Firm is a central Pennsylvania fixture when it comes to DUI and criminal defense. 
The attorneys and staff at the McShane firm believe in old-fashioned central Pennsylvania values of hard work and straight talking. Give them a call if you or a loved one ever needs help.